Okay, so this is the next question that we got on the menu today. Um, it's actually six questions, but, you know, it's uh, nothing to be worried about at all. This can still be a good, fun time, okay? Don't be worried about all these words. We just got to read them and get meaning out of them, okay? So the first question is asking us, a block is placed on a plane whose angle of inclination is 30 degrees. Pretty much what that means is, like, we have, like, a, a ramp like this. And um, this angle right here, 30 degrees, yeah, that's, that's what that means, by a plane on an inclination. Um, the coefficient of static friction, the coefficients of static and kinetic friction on the block of the inclined plane are both 0 0.2. Okay, so, um, so when we have a block like this, we know that our u s is equal to our mu k, these are coefficients of friction, is equal to 0 0.2. Okay, so uh, we want to find out pretty much how is this block going to interact with, this, with the ramp. Is it going to stay in place? Is it going to slide down? Is it going to travel up at a constant velocity? Is it going to travel down at a constant velocity? Or is it going to accelerate up? Okay, so the first things that we can disqualify is that there is no mention of anything that would cause an upwards force there like the only force that appears to be um the only forces that appear to be valid in this situation are friction and gravity so friction and gravity only only impossible for block to go upwards. Okay, and um, another thing that we know is that constant velocity is only possible only possible when zero net force says uh, or the question says that the block was placed on it which and it if it uh if it was put on the on the ramp with like, an initial velocity it would say it would be put on it with an initial velocity so saying that is placed on it means that it was put on with the velocity of zero so um Initial velocity zero. So this actually disqualifies some of our multiple choice options. So accelerates up and travels at constant velocity. All these three disqualified. Okay, so now we just got to know, is it accelerating down the plane or is it going to stay in place? Okay, so another thing that we want to know, that we want to mention is that... Um, how, or an easy way that we can go about this is to think about how um, the coefficient of friction is defined. So this is, for static friction, defined as tan theta of um, where theta is the angle at which the stationary block starts to slide. Okay, so um, maybe as a real life example of this, uh, if I got like, um, here I have my like calculator. It's um like I get, I get my calculator case and here. So right now you can see it's not sliding, but as I tilt it, eventually, um, you know, you see this cover is eventually going to start to slide. The moment that that angle starts to slide, you take a, ang a measurement of the angle and you take the tan of that angle. That's going to give you the coefficient of friction. So using that process, we can go. We can take the coefficient of friction that they give us and go backwards. Okay, so um. If, like maybe we can do this even fire higher up here, so if tan angle 
is equal to 0.2, because that was the our given coefficient of static friction. That means theta is just the tan inverse of 0 0.2. Now asking my handy dandy calculator to figure that out for me is um, tan inverse of 0 0.2 is 11 degrees. 11.31 degrees. Angle where sliding starts. So the angle has to be less than 11 degrees for this to stay stationary, right? So if it's here, it's a very small angle, you're not going to slide. But when you got it really sloped up like this, more likely to slide. So you can see, we know that 30 is, is greater than the critical angle where it starts sliding. Uh, 30 is bigger than this. Eleven point three one degrees must be sliding at this point, and it's sliding because the frictional force is not enough to completely counteract the gravitational force, and that's why it's sliding. Which means there is a net force that is not zero, and when there is an unbalanced force uh, or a net force uh, more than zero, there has to be some acceleration. So that disqualifies A, which is it remains stationary. So we know that it has to be B. Um, the accelerated, the block will go down the um, slope. Okay, was well, that the answer that we had here? Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just write that out real fast because uh, that's uh, important. Part one, block slides because um, angle, oops, of starting, the slide is 11 degrees. Okay, cool. So that, that's uh, the first part of the question. The second part of the question is um, a whole different situation. Okay, so I'm gonna just clear off this whiteboard just to have a little bit more space. Second part of the question is not really connected to the first, but still along the same lines. So an object of mass 5.5 kilograms is allowed to slide from rest um, down an inclined plane. The plane makes an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal and is 72 meters long. The coefficient of friction between the plane and the object is 0 0.35. Uh, and it's trying to get us to figure out what is the speed of the object at the bottom of the plane. Okay, so let's actually draw out this situation right here. So we got a uh, big long triangle like this. Move it down like that. And we got a block at the top that looks like this. And they said it was 5.5 kilograms. Okay, uh, we know that the distance the length of this thing, the entire ramp, is 72 meters. 72 meters, exactly. We know that this angle got to be 30 degrees. Okay, uh, another thing that gave us the coefficient of friction is kinetic friction because it is sliding, it is 0 0.35. We want to find speed of the object at the bottom. Of object at bottom. So first I'll write out our plan on how to go through this and then we will go through the plan step by step. Uh, first we want to find net force on block. Then we want to get the work done on block. And then uh, work equals kinetic energy. Uh, 
and isolate velocity. Okay, cool. So the first step here, we have to find the net force on the block. And um, we want to maybe set up, or we definitely want to set up our coordinates so that our coordinates are parallel to the slope itself. So let's say this is the positive x direction and this is the y direction. Okay, let's make a free body diagram of the block. Um, you can just make it a point here. So we know that we have our gravitational force and um, our line of action is like this. And uh, kind of like this. So we have 30 degrees. Um, yeah, like that. And we have our force of friction like this. And we have a normal force like this. Y and X. Okay, so this is a free body diagram of, um, of our situation, but um, you know, it's just not drawn on the ramp. So this is, this is pretty much what the block is gonna be like. These are the forces that the block are gonna experience. Okay, and um, you know, to resolve everything along the X and Y axis, we're gonna need to break down MG into its um, X and Y components. Okay, I'll do that in a different color to kind of show how we can uh, pull that off. So we're gonna have this, let's call that MG um, Y. And this is added with that MG X. Okay, so as you can see, um, now everything is along the lines of action of our question. And um, knowing this, we can get the net force on here, which is gonna be straight down the ramp. And um, yeah, that. And once we have that, we're one step closer to our final answer. Cool. So um, we know um, that Fn, the normal force, has to be equal to mgy. And the reason why is because, well, if the force along the y-axis, meaning like up and down relative to the ramp, if it was non-zero, that means like the block would either be going into the ramp or it'd be flying off the ramp. That is not the case. It's always sliding along the ramp. And if we look at our coordinate system, we can see that the y value, like with this tilted coordinate system, the y value is always gonna be the same. The only thing that really matters is the x, but we still need to consider our y and we know that there's gonna be zero net force along there. And the only way that there's gonna be zero net force along the y axis is if the normal force is equal in magnitude to the y component, the tilted y component of the gravitational force. Okay, so when we think about this, um, when we look at this, you would see it's a right angle triangle situation. And the y component is associated with cos 30. Hmm, you see that? So we could write this as m g cos, uh, whoops, cos 30. Okay, seems about reasonable. And um, we know what M and G are. M was given to us as 5.5 .5 kilogram. And we know that G is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared times cos 30. Let's ask our calculator to get us the answer for that. 5.5 .5 times 9.8 times cos 30 degrees and my calculation for that fn is equal to 46.679 newtons okay now why do we need the normal force because it is a part of our calculation for the frictional force Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is we want to take up the forces in the um, in the x direction or in the tilted x direction, basically um, alongside the surface of the slope. So we know that we're going to have the x component of the gravitational force plus uh, and the frictional force. Uh, we're not going to know what they are, so 
um, we can write this as the sum of all forces along the x direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration down the x direction and we're trying to solve for for the a value and this is going to be the mgx and mgx is positive because you see it's going along the positive x direction minus force of friction and you see force of friction is negative because it's going the opposite direction of the positive uh, x direction pretty much the frictional force is going up is towards up the slope okay so um, another way that we can write this is m a x we can write uh, m g the x component instead of cos 30 is going to be sine 30 minus the normal uh, frictional force is actually the normal force times the coefficient of friction so it's going to be fn multiplied by mu k okay and this is um what we want to do is now we're just going to sub in these numbers so m a x actually we don't need the um we just need the x we actually need the force not the acceleration um but uh yeah we can, just, we can keep writing it like that so we have 5.5 .5 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared multiplied by sine 30 minus fn of uh, the normal force which is 46.679 multiplied by the coefficient of friction which is 0 0.35 okay so let's send this into my calculator to figure out what this is that our normal force times negative 0.35 plus 5.5 .5 times the 9.8 times sine 30 degrees and my calculation for this fx is equal to 10.61 newtons okay awesome now that we have the net force down ramp we want to get the work done across the ramp the work done by net force across the ramp cross ramp okay so we know that work represented with w is f times d and um, we know that f and d are going to be parallel so we can just multiply them regularly and uh, normally you do a dot product but um, in a one-dimensional situation like this is really just multiplication so we know that our net force is going to be 10.61 newtons multiply that by our distance that it is uh, that the force is applied for which is 72 meters in this case oops not capital M little m so Let's calculate that real fast. So our previous number times 72. And we have 764.1 um, joules. Joules is the unit of work. And um, hopefully some of you recognize that joules is also a unit of energy, which is exactly where we're going to go to next, because we know that all the work becomes kinetic energy and we've already considered like we have the net force so we don't need to consider the work done by friction because that's already incorporated into the force itself okay so all all of the work done by the net force is turned into kinetic energy so we know that um, work is equal to kinetic energy which is equal to one half mv squared okay so if we want to isolate the velocity value we would do two times the work divided by mass under the root is equal to our velocity and our velocity is what we're really after here the speed of the object at the bottom 
Okay, so let's put under the root 2 multiplied by our work value, which was 764.1 joules, divided by our mass, which is 5.5 kilogram. Okay, and um, let's calculate that out. 2. Uh, well, let's get the root there first. 2 times the previous thing. Divide 5.5 under the root gives us 16.67 meters per second. And that would be our final answer for um, the second part of this question. Velocity of block at bottom of ramp. And it seems like a reasonable um, speed because 72 meters is quite long um, and like a force of 10 newtons applied over that type of uh, distance seems like a reasonable answer okay cool oh does do we come to the same conclusion here exactly so that's awesome for part two and we can move on to part three okay so i'm gonna clear this off and okay we can move on to part three of this question uh, so a five kilogram object slides down a frictionless surface inclined at an angle of 30 degrees from the horizontal total distance moved along by the object is um, 10 meters what is the work done on the object by the normal force okay so let's draw the situation and the quick answer is zero whoops that is not a slope it's not the shape i was looking for it's uh, this one okay so here we we have a block sliding down here We have the normal force is going here, right? It's got a right angle to here, and the block is traveling this way. There is no work done by the normal force because work is um, the force that is parallel to the movement. So work only occurs when the force is parallel to the direction of travel. Okay, the normal force is completely perpendicular to the direction of travel, so there is no contribution of the normal force, uh, or the normal force does not do any work on the block as it's sliding down here, because, well, you're going the other direction, and you're not moving it in that direction. It's not working out. Another, a nice way that I can think about this is like, imagine yourself pushing around a shopping cart. When you're pushing around a shopping cart, there's still a gravitational force on the shopping cart. And the gravitational force is going down and you're pushing it like, you know, horizontally. Gravity is not doing any work for you. It's always going down, but it's you that's pushing it around. You are the only one that's providing a force in the same direction as the shopping cart. There is a gravitational force, but it's not doing any work. The work done is only when the force um, you know, in the shopping cart example, it's you pushing the cart. Only when the force is in the same direction as the as the travel of the object, that's the only time the work happens. Okay, so uh, perpendicular forces, zero work, doesn't work out. And uh, yeah, so that would be, um, yeah, no work. Awesome. So that concludes part three. Now part four is a little bit of a different situation. Okay, let's clear that off. So part four is asking us, a mass of 2.5 kilogram is sliding along a table, a frictionless table, um, with an initial speed of V. And we don't know what V is. Uh, I think we're gonna, need, yeah, we're gonna need to calculate V. When it strikes a spring, all this, uh, and the force constant of the spring is 500 newtons per meter, it compresses by a distance of five centimeters. So now, we, knowing that, we have to calculate the initial speed of the block. Okay, so let's write out our given information. We know that the mass of the block is equal to 2.5 kilograms. That's about 5 pounds, maybe a little bit more. 
we know that the spring constant 500 newtons per meter we know that the compressed distance I, I prefer to write it as delta x um, because like x is typically for like a particular distance and delta is like the change in distance really measuring like the amount that is compressed so I prefer to use delta x but um, if you just use regular x just make sure you keep it straight in your head that it's a um, uh, you know it's a it's gonna be a compression and here we have five centimeters but to, to make this a little bit easier for our calculations we can write five times ten to the negative two meters and that is 0 0.05 meters okay just just was a little bit easier to calculate and um, I actually that's all the information that we really need to know uh, about this situation so we know that initially the the total energy in this system is constant Initially, all energy is kinetic, is kinetic energy in the moving block. All of that energy, all of that kinetic energy, all that kenergy, <laughs> is then transformed into spring potential energy. Okay, so when basically what's happening is the sliding block slides and as it hits the spring it's slowing down and once it is going to momentarily have a, a velocity of zero, no, uh, no kinetic energy at that point. And at that point, it's going to slide back and, um, you know, uh, the spring is going to recoil and push it back outwards. So pretty much what we want to have is, is U spring, U meaning potential energy, potential, that's the way I remember it, is going to be equal to the max kinetic energy of the, um, of the whole thing. Okay, so we know that uh, we can write out these equations uh, for potential energy of a spring. We know that there is one half k delta x squared, and this is equal to its kinetic energy initially, which is one half m v squared. We're trying to isolate v for velocity. So to do that, well. Um, we can multiply both sides by, uh, or let's just send everything to the left side. Uh, we can have like v squared is equal to k delta x squared over m, and um, put that all under the root. So v is equal to under the root k times delta x squared over m all under the root okay now let's sub in our numbers for this and we can be happy so k is equal to 500 newtons per meter it's a pretty strong spring gotta say I'm compressed by five centimeters so that is 0 0.05 meters that's got to be squared that's all divided by the mass which was 2.5 kilograms Wow, I really just did memorize that. Awesome. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's um, ask our old calculator, what is the result of this calculation? So under the root, we shall have 500 multiplied 0 0.05 squared divided by 2.5, all of that under the root. We get our velocity is 0 0.71 meters per second. Okay, 
So that would be our initial velocity of the block. Do we have the same calculation here? Uh, yeah, we do. Awesome. So um, this is based on the law of the conservation of energy. And given that, we are we're good. We're groovy. Cool. So um, that wraps up part four of this very long question. However, we got to keep it moving till the finish line. We ain't done until we're done. So the next part of this question is um, the graph. This graph right here shows the position of a particle, and it depends on time. What is the closest to the instant instantaneous speed of the particle at t equals um, 3 seconds? So that's about here. And um, pretty much what we want to do here is we want to analyze the slope at this point is going to be um, pretty much what we want to um, we want to find the slope at um, time equals 3 right here. So slope at t equals 3 will give us the uh, instantaneous velocity. Okay, so looking at the slope, um, it's not quite easy for me to like put like a ruler on the screen. But if you were put a ruler on the screen at um, at, at like time equals three, you would see that it definitely looks less uh, less steep than one. Um, like one would be like. Um, you know, if you draw a line from like x equals y, um, that straight line is more steep than this. So by observation, must be less than 1 because the slope is flatter than a 45 degree line. Okay, so that's instantly going to disqualify D and E. Okay, so next we want to look around the neighborhood of 3, and you can see, hey, if we go like to the right, I mean to the left um, by 1, um, and to the right by 1, you can see like as you traverse 2 seconds from t equals 2 to t equals 4, you're going up by just under one so that actually kind of corresponds to a um a slope of around 0 0.5 so should be around 0 0.5 because from t equals 2 to t equals 4 there is a um, increase of honestly it's just less than one and I know that it's just less than one because at t equals two it seems closer to the line above it than it does at t equals four Okay, which means that since it's just less than 1, must be less, less than 0 0.5. If we observe that like it was closer to the line above it at time equals 4 uh, than it was at time equals 2, uh, we would know that it must be like just above 0 0.5. But since we know that it has to be less than 0 0.5, and there's, there's only one option that's less than 0 0.5, which is still pretty close to 0 0.5, which must be 0 0.4 meters per second squared so this would be our best guess for um, the instantaneous velocity at time equals three okay so hopefully we have a similar conclusion here yep correct answer is a uh yeah and i, I guess i did take some numbers from there but um you know uh, you don't really need to do the calculation if you're just uh good at observing stuff so just look at the immediate neighbors of it and help uh, calculate it that way 
And uh, yeah, so we know that it must be uh, answer A, just based on the things that we looked at. And um, if you're doing this in real life, like this would probably be printed out on a paper, honestly, just like take a ruler, stick it on your paper, and just try to draw a line of best fit at around t equals three, and then try to find the slope of that line, see who lines up closest to it, all right? Cool, so that wraps up uh, the fifth part of this hexadecimal question, hexa six term question. And okay, so the next part of the question is, Kek is asking us, uh, I guess in a completely unrelated to uh, the, all the other parts of the question, is asking us, calculate the work done by the force um, 2x i along the path um, 0, 0, to um, p, uh, this point, which is two zero, to the next point two two. Okay, so our force is like this. So we have two x i plus zero j. Okay, so this is our force. I know the question doesn't write zero j, but we know that there is. Because we don't have a written y component of this force, it has to be a zero y component. I'm just writing it out explicitly so that when we do, um, you know, the cross products, it's going to be, uh, I mean, the dot products is going to make a lot of sense. Okay, so it's looking for the work done it's from zero, zero to um, two, zero. And then from two zero until two two. Okay, so let's call this path one. Let's call this path two. So we want to pretty much um, just find the work total is equal to the work of path one plus the work done of path two. So to find the, the work, we know that work is equal to the force, oh, that's a vector force, dot product the um, distance, the vector distance between the two points. Okay, so for path one, we know that, well, our first force vector is just going to be 2x in the i direction plus a 0 in the j direction cross product with um, now we have to find the distance between them uh, between point 1 and point 2 so pretty much what you do here is like 2 minus 0 in the i direction plus um, 0 minus 0 in the j direction. Okay. Distance vector from origin to P1. Always do destination minus start. Okay, so um, let's just call that P1. So um, the cross product of this is going to be 2x times 2 plus 0 times 0. I know we don't strictly need to write that, but just be formal with the dot product definition. It's going to be like this. So um, the result of work from path 1, well, that's just going to be 4x. Okay, so that's the first part of our stuff. The second thing that we need to do is the work done on path 2. And we know that it's going to be the same dot product, or it's going to be a similar dot product, but we have a different, uh, you know, distance vector. So we have 2x i, the same force, right? Uh, yeah, it's all, the force is going to be constant throughout this whole uh, situation, plus 0j. And we dot product that with, now our starting point is um, 2, 2. So it's going to be 2 minus 2. In the i direction and this is going to be plus um, 2 minus 0 whoops let's make that 2 a little bit more pretty 
2 minus 0 in the j direction. So here is p1 to p2 to 0 until 2 2. Okay, and as you can see, this would just be um, 2 in the y component. So the calculation of this is going to be dub path 2 is equal to 2x multiplied by, well, 0 plus 0 multiplied by 2. And this is just going to be equal to 0. Okay, and this makes perfect sense because the displacement was purely in the y direction and the force is purely in the x direction. When the work and the force are perpendicular, or I mean when the, when the force and the distance that it travels are perpendicular to each other, there is no work in response to that. Okay, so, um, you know, we have our, our work from path 1 and our work from path 2. We know that our work net total is going to be equal to them added up. So it's going to be 4x plus uh, 0. So it's just going to be 4, uh, 4x. Okay, so that's going to be our total work. Awesome. Hopefully we have the same conclusion here. Uh, yeah, it's going to be 4x. And um, uh, you should... All this left is to mention is that uh, the total force would be the sum of there. Yeah. Cool. So this solution is pretty good. So that is part six. Yep. The total force is a sum. work of the should be shown otherwise all good. Awesome. That's a very long question.